So we are officially live with uh, Josh Pather here. So, you know, before we talk about your businesses, which uh, you're in the photo booth industry, photo booth business. <gasps> now tell us about your origin story of how you got into entrepreneurship. Okay. Yeah. So, um, where did it all start? I'm trying to think about what my, my first business was. Uh, so I actually, I'm from South Africa originally. We moved uh, to America in 2001. Um, my, you know, obviously for a better life, right? Everybody come for the American dream. So we, we kind of sold all the stuff that we had. Uh, you know, sold our house. So like everything we owned, we just put a for sale sign. People will come in and buy, like just walk into the house, buy a TV, furniture, mm -hmm. like cutlery and, it was crazy. And then the rest of the stuff we had, we just packed it in a bag. And we came here with two bags. And then uh, I was like, man, it's a big change for me. So I just, uh, I guess I just wanted to have everything I didn't have or just seeing the way how other people lived. And I wanted it so mm -hmm. bad. And I was like, man, I got to do something. Uh, and so I think mowing lawns was probably my first one, uh, first business, uh, 20 bucks a lawn. You know, and like, I remember like coming to Texas, it was so hot, man. Like, yeah. It's a different kind of heat <laughs> that I've never experienced before. I feel and so I just remember like mowing lawns and I'm like, man, I gotta, I need some water. So I like go up to the people's door, like ring the bell, like, hey, can you give me a glass of water with some ice, please? Really? You, you actually did that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Dude. For sure. That's like the first, the first one. Uh, after that, I would probably say, um, uh, started importing, so this this would have been like like uh, middle school going mm -hmm. into high school. Start this was probably like oh six oh five oh six. I was importing uh, Nike shoes from Alibaba, man. <laughs> so I, was, I was importing fake shoes and like selling them like at school. And so I would like go to Albertsons, like wire a couple hundred dollars to China. Cause you, you only had like Western Union back then, right? Never got caught. Yeah, I got busted, man. You got busted. Yeah. I got busted big time. Did you get jumped? Huh? Did no, you get no. Jumped? No. <laughs> no, not jumped. I was cool, with everybody, man. Cause I, I gave, you know, like it was big back then. You know, I was like matching shoes, matching clothes, and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would be uh, Jordans, Nikes, like just all the latest fashion. You know, I had it, and so uh, I, I built a website, bro. Yahoo sites. We're talking two thousand. 2007 Yahoo sites, right? That, that's all you had at the time. You didn't really have like Shopify and stuff back then. Mm -hmm. Or at least I didn't know about it. So put all the catalog on there, all the shoes. Then I come home from school one day, open the mailbox, Nike Corporation versus Josh Pather, trademark law, infringing. Yo. Lost. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Uh, it was pretty that's crazy. The last thing you want. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they had like screenshots and like they had my name everywhere. And like me and my supplier at the time, like we were, we were really cool. And he would actually uh, like ship the product before I pay for it. Uh, and so he was like, hey, can I, use you, can I use your name on my website? I was like, yeah, that's fine. So this guy had my name on, the, on his homepage. And then like when we got the lawsuit, they had a screenshot like, yeah, we know who you're getting it from. This is your name here on the website. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so and after that, I was like, okay, I got a little scared. I was like, all right, I'm gonna stop. So that, that was my first lesson. Uh, and then just various different things after that, I started DJing uh, and then learning about, uh, I met a friend and he showed me how to, he had a blog and he was making money on the blog, like through AdSense. Yeah. And when blogging time, was huge? Uh, like out 2014, 2012? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly around that time. And I was like, man, that's crazy. You just, he had like a, it was like an anime blog. He was into all that stuff. And, and he he logged into his AdSense account and he showed me, he's like, you made like two, 300 bucks doing nothing at all today, just from the traffic. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, that's cool. I got to learn that. So I just went really deep into like learning how to build a blog and how to build a website. Then like, ranking these websites, uh, you know, for specific terms and then getting people uh, to come and, and read the blog. Like, you know, I'll just pick a topic. Um, I don't know, best computer microphone.com, you know, I'd make mm -hmm. like a three page website, rank it in the front front page, get a, you know, a couple hundred people there every month and then make money off the ads. Uh, and then uh, woke up one day and then Google did like an update 
<laughs> like wiped out. It was like the Panda and Penguin updates is what it was called. And it wiped out like all the websites. So I was like, geez. But I, I learned a lot, you know, like how to make a website and stuff. And then uh, I got a phone call from a friend and he was like, hey, I saw a photo booth at a wedding. I think we should do it. And I was like, okay. Like, I, I didn't have any other side projects going on at that uh, time. So I knew how to build a website and I knew how to rank it. So uh, we named the company Photo Booth Dallas, which that keyword was getting already 500 searches a month. And so uh, I was, we were able to like get it to the front page of Google, you know, in a matter of like four or five months. You know, and it's still there till this day, you know, eight years later. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how, you know, we got into the photo booth business and uh, that, that took off and did really good. First year we did six figures. Um, six months later, after starting the photo booth business, um, I was working at the call center. They called me in and they said, hey, we're moving your job overseas. And I was like, man, this is, I think this is a sign, you know, like it's time for me to go full time. Yeah. <laughs> spread my wings. So uh, I ended up taking the severance package. And then uh, the last day to work was like July 2013. And uh, yeah, I've been on my own since then. Uh, we in 2015 we started uh, selling the photo booths so we opened mm -hmm. up photo booth international which is what i'm involved in right now and so we help people uh start the photo booth rental business uh, and we, we teach them everything you know how to get started uh business contracts websites we give them a private facebook group all of that is included with the purchase of the photo booth um and we try to share all this all the mistakes we made you know whenever we started we didn't really have anyone to guide us um and so, you know, we try to make sure that they're successful and we don't just sell them the booth, you know, we, we, we're there with them all the, all the way along. Okay. So you're not just selling the product, but you kind of give them the full spectrum of everything that they need. So you legit sell these booths, but where are they, you know, who are your, your, your buyers here? Is it like huge retail spaces, maybe a mall that has a, a photo booth, for example, or who are your, who's your target audience? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's everyday people, man, that, you know, maybe, drop shipping is not for them. Maybe affiliate marketing is not for them. Maybe, you know, FBA is not for them or they've tried it. They, they don't like it. They're not happy at their job. They want something on the side. It doesn't take much. You know, you can get a photo booth for eight grand, you know, just do one event a week at 500 a pop, you know, that's extra two grand a month in your pocket, you know, and you still have six days plus a whole entire day, you know, to do other stuff, right? It can just be a side hustle that you can do. Uh, or you can do it full time and you can make a decent income with it. Um, so, you know, I would say uh, it's hard to like uh, predict, not predict, but to segment uh, who our customer would be. But, you know, if someone, because we've sold, you know, to young kids, we've sold to, to older people. Um, but mainly entrepreneurs is what we focus on. That's, okay. that's basically our specialty. When I think of photo booths, I think of a. Uh... You know, one of those, you know, have you been to like M&M World or, you know, you go to a movie theater or a mall I got you. and there's mm -hmm. those huge photo booths. Yeah. Do you sell that along with other things? Like what's your, what's your main product or what other products do you sell on your site? Yeah. So, so the one that you see, like, uh, that's permanently installed at the movie theater and all that mm -hmm. stuff, those, we don't really sell that. Our ones are portable ones. Uh, okay. so they can, you know, fold up, break down into a case, mm -hmm. uh, one or two people can move it around. Uh, the, the most popular ones now, we just came out with a new one called the Chloe photo booth. Uh, that one's um, uh, $4,000. Uh, it has a mirror on it, webcam, uh, touchscreen, speakers. Um, it's it's, uh, it's kind of like that circle right there behind me. It's like okay. a 12 inch uh, circle to explain. And also we have this, the standing mirrors. It's like a full size mirror photo booth. Uh, so you walk up to it, touch the screen. It's like a mirror touch screen. Those are really popular now. Uh, we have 20 different models. So, mm. you know, it just depends what, what uh, someone wants to go with, what kind of vibe they want to have for their company. And, uh, you know, they start off at like 4,000, they go up to about $10,000 and, uh, you know, anywhere in between. Now, is this a product that you developed? You know, did you have to make it not by maybe by scratch? Did you have designers or was it a drop shipping product? I mean, a really high end one. No, no, we, we make everything. Yeah. I'm, so I design all the products. Um, you know, I just 
from my experience of like going to events and knowing what it's like, like, oh, okay, it's too heavy. It's too big. Maybe there's, you go to a venue, there's no elevator, you know, how are you going to move, get it upstairs? So, you know, I, I bring all of that to the table and we come up with the different designs based on like what people have asked me for, uh, you know, the cool factor. Um, and so I, I often actually go to China multiple times a year. Oh, wow. So I, I go to the factory and we, you know, we work with the, the engineer there. And so they, you know, they do the, the metal work, the welding, that kind of stuff yeah. there. Uh, they ship the, the shells to Dallas and then we install all the electronics and stuff uh, here in Dallas and uh, then do all the testing and everything like that. And then we ship it out uh, to our, our buyers. Yeah. I mean, okay, look, that seems like a lot of, I feel like you need a high amount of capital. You need a lot of capital for that project. Of course, you know, you need the molds, the design, the engineers, that's not cheap, right? So how did you first get started? Did you create a minimal viable product to test the idea out for the photo booths or, or what? What did you do first in your very, very, very first pro uh, product? Uh, so the first product, I would say, um, you know, we built it ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the first photo booth we built ourselves, you know, out of MDF wood and went to like um, Home Depot and did that. And, you know, we, we tested the concept. So the concept was there uh, and then we just uh, improved upon it every time. Uh, and so that kind of limited our risk, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, cause Obviously, we're not just going in like, hey, let's come up with a product and hopefully it sells. We know it was selling because we were renting it out ourselves, you know, and we okay. just had to like, okay, we need to make this lighter. Okay, let's make it lighter. And what, what does that look like? Okay, okay, it looks like this. And then like, let's see who can make this for us. And like, okay, then, you know, maybe we use that for six months. Like, okay, let's improve it here. Let's make another one. So it's just, it's just more different versions of it. Kind of like the iPhone, if you will. Yeah. Like, it just gets okay. better and better. <laughs> I feel you. Yeah. So how do you do? That's really intriguing because how did you figure out, okay, there's a market for this. There's an opportunity to make a new category here in photo booths. Um, how did you initialize or find that idea? So um, I was, I was a wedding DJ. Uh, I, was, I was DJing and uh, you know, every time you go to weddings, there's always like, you like learn new stuff, you know, I guess new trends, the brides mm -hmm. are like, you know, they're on Pinterest or whatever the case is, okay. or find new ideas. So you, you just get different ideas. So we, we saw the photo booths there and we're like, Hey, we can, we can do a better job with that, you know? And so that's kind of where, what sparked the idea. Cause we were already in the uh, event business that, you know, I was at that time I was at the call center. I would DJ weddings, you know, on the weekends or something like that, you know, not, not often every other weekend. So, um, and so we just saw other people doing it like, Hey, we can do a better job and add that to already what we're doing. And so that's kind of what sparked us, you know, renting the photo booths. And then while we were at the events, people were like, hey, this seems cool. I want to do this. You know, where did you guys buy a photo booth from? Hmm. And it's like, okay, after some time, it's like, okay, we got to fill that gap now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So that's crazy. And mm -hmm. then you guys took action. So your first action was making that first photo, uh, photo booth, you said with wood, you know, yeah. not an actual real production, but you know, you saw a need for it. Yeah. And that's also really intriguing because I feel that when you have a new product or even for drop shippers, what they're doing is they're getting a, an existing product and mm -hmm. they're selling it, maybe doing different marketing strategies to find a different target audience to sell it. Right. But in this case, uh, you created a new category. And I, as a matter of fact, were you, is it fair to say that you guys were the first ones to do this kind of creating a portable photo booth or were there other, businesses doing the same uh i would say that there are maybe two or three other uh people that are doing the same thing yeah okay uh the difference with us it would be you know people sometimes like you have the industries right where people just wake up and they're like hey we're gonna start selling this product today you mm -hmm. know what i mean because it's hot right like fidget spinners, right? I'm sure everybody in China, like every factory, hey, we got to sell this. Like one day they're selling, you know, makeup brushes and then they stop the makeup brush factory and they turn it into a fidget spinner factory, right? Mm -hmm. So, but with us, it's like, you know, we, we, we came from the rental business and so we know exactly what the customer wants. A lot of my competitors, you know, I would say they're maybe engineers by trade, 
you know, and they like, they see like, oh, well, this, this could be a good thing to sell and they design something, but they don't have the experience of, um, okay, going to events themselves. You know, mm -hmm. I've worked, you know, thousands of events, you know, so I know exactly what it's like. I know what it's like to get there and, and there's no power outlet close by. I know what it's like when the ceilings are too low. So the flash umbrella is not going to work. Uh, you know, you're going to be set up in someone's garage or you're going to be set up at the Omni Hotel downtown. You know, you're maybe at a backyard party or you may be at a $150,000 wedding, you know? And so um, I bring that to the table. And so that's what we tell our customers. Like, hey, we know what it's like. You know, you're not going to go get this product and figure out, ah, oh, it doesn't do what you need or it's um, missing something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. That's crazy, man. I, 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 that's what I like a lot about, you know, people creating their own products, you know, solving a problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a different model and a more rigorous one. Really difficult because you have to go, you know, you can have an idea and then, but to actually make a concept and have it realized through a manufacturer and engineers is another thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Our manufacturing is a, can be a hellhole. Now, I see that you have a couple of two comma awards, yeah. two comma club awards. Now, was that kind of your your way of making these sales using those uh, conversion pages and whatnot, landing pages? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't use the awards to sell more. No, uh, no, no, like, not the awards. <laughs> like the, the system, like uh, yeah. ClickFunnels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. So we um, we signed up with ClickFunnels about. 2016, I think, or 2015. And, um, you know, we started using them, it, you know, the understanding click funnels from, from not having click funnels to getting set up on there is like, it's a lot, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so once you, but once you got it figured out, you know, it's a good system to have. So yeah, the first one, uh, was for the rentals. Uh, you know, we did a, a million dollars, uh, you know, with the photo booth rentals. And so, you know, that's the first plaque. Uh, and then the second one uh, was for selling photo booths and I, I almost, uh, almost going to have the, the $10 million one <laughs> it was this, this was going to be the year. So probably I think halfway next year, I'll be able to apply for that one. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's good. I mean, a lot of the people that we sell to, you know, obviously they're not, they're first time business owners. They don't really know marketing and stuff like that. And, um, so we try to show them like, Hey, I've done it. You know, you can do it. I have no college experience, no marketing degree, no nothing like that. You know, I just learned everything by myself. I'm self-taught. And so you can do it too, you know. Uh, and in the middle there, that was uh, the Inc. 5000 Award uh, for the fastest growing company in America, number 1239. Uh, and then we got number 63 in Texas. So that's good. You know, seeing your hard work paid off, you know, you got you to put the grind in. You know, there was several years of grinding and, you know, working seven days a week. You know, because like, hey, we're at the office Monday through Friday, and then the, on the weekends we were, um, you know, doing events. And uh, but you know, it pays off. It pays off if you got to stick to it. You know, so you got to stay focused, like you said, uh, and you got to execute. You know, mm -hmm. information is no longer the problem. I mean, you're providing great information, to everybody listening, right? You know, I was checking out the podcast. Like, hey, there's all types of businesses there, but who's going to take it and run with it? You know? Oh, for sure. Year? Like, information is readily available. And you got to ask the right questions on Google, YouTube, whatever. And you have to take the information and do something with it. Right. But that's a totally different story. And I'm pretty sure you've been through a lot, a lot of challenges and you, you know, you doing this almost virtually by yourself. You got to do the marketing, the design, customer service, all that type of stuff. Now, what was the biggest challenge in, in, in your respect? Because you're doing all these things at once. <laughs> biggest challenge. Um, I would so the say biggest um, hurdle. my biggest hurdle, you know, and, and this is going to be most business owners, you know, it's going to be the accounting, you know, mm. I, I mean, that's just real talk right there. Cause uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, like, Hey, we want to just get started. We want to sell, we want to do what we love. And we're like, Oh yeah, my sister does the accounting or my uncle, he's an accountant. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to deal with it. Every day I talk to entrepreneurs like that. Okay. How's your accounting? Look? How's your books? Do you know your profit and loss? You know, your balance sheet, you know, what's your net profit this month? What's your gross profit? You know, what, what, what'd you gross last month? You know, was, was your last month's gross and this month's gross the same, but your net changed? They're like, ah, oh, I don't know what <laughs> yeah. about that. You know, I got 50 grand in the bank account. We're doing good. Like, nah, bro, we can't be like managing your business on your bank account. You know what I mean? 
that's going to be the biggest problem right there. I think for a lot of people, you know, and right now, you know, I, I, I do consulting for businesses. When, when we go into a business, we take over their accounting and we take over their marketing, mm-hmm. you know? So it, I have my business partner, he's a fractional CFO who has been in, in banking for 20 years. He's taught me a lot. I've learned a lot, but once you really understand your books of your business, then you're really operating a proper business because you can log in there and you know where your money is being spent. I think a lot of amateur entrepreneurs get involved and they don't want to, they don't want any part of it, right? They just, they don't even think about it until once a year when they meet with their accountant or something like that. And they're like, oh, okay, how much do I owe? And that's it. But at the end of the day, man, you can't sell anything like that. It's not yeah. valuable. You know what I mean? And you're not a, a, like part of being an entrepreneur. I had to sit down like, look, I got to understand this stuff. Mm-hmm. because I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was making money because there's money coming in, you know, every day in the bank account. Like, okay, cool. We're doing good. But hey, if you don't have that stuff taken care of and if you don't have a proper accountant, that's, you know, not going to screw you over. You're going to get screwed over with accountants, hundred percent. You know, when you start bringing it in accountants, you know, if you, if you don't know enough to make sure they're doing it properly, they're going to, they're going to screw you over. Every business owner I talk to, you know, that's had, you know, success. They've been through three, four or five accountants and you find the one that's, you know, uh, that you, uh, that does a good, good enough job to where, you know, that he's doing the work, it's worth the money and you understand Mm -hmm. what he's doing. You're going to get to that point, you know, but I would say the accounting for sure. Mm -hmm. And how did you go about manufacturing this process, uh, these products, your products? Because you know, you said you have to go to China, right? And yeah. because these products are so expensive, maybe it is worth going there. Because if you create a product and you don't go there, then you're not going to know how good it is unless they send a sample, right? But if you're there directly, you'll save a lot more time and, and money. Yeah. So how is the design process as you, you know, iterated every year? Like you said, your product is kind of like the new iPhone each year. Yeah. Uh, you improve it. Yeah, it's tough, man. It's not for everybody. You know, going to China is not an easy thing. <laughs> you know, last year, uh, it's, 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 it's funny, man. Last year, um, uh, when I went there, I actually, I was in a hotel and I, ca- I caught something, man. I think it was COVID-19. I couldn't breathe like within four hours. Like I had, uh, my lungs were full with, with, uh, phlegm and, uh, man, I was in Guangzhou and I was sitting there in the room by myself. I was telling my, I tell my wife the story all the time. I was like, imagine being in a communist country by yourself and you can't mm-hmm. breathe. Like I, lucky I was with my friend, you know, and I, I, I had some tea and I was like, just, I didn't want to go to the hospital. The closest hospital was like Guangzhou Hospital Number Four. And I know I'd rather take my chances before I go over there, right? Now, nothing wrong. Chinese people are great. Love them. You know, like great friends. They take care of me, all that stuff. But uh, going over there is, is like pretty intimidating. If you don't know anything, like they don't speak English, you know, hardly, you know, in, in, in major cities and stuff like that. Um, you know, I have a driver. They, you know, the driver takes us around. Uh, we have a translator. We go to the factories and stuff like that. So uh, starting off, you know, start small. Like my China journey started 10 years ago, right? When I was importing shoes, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I knew the way they operated from then, from back then, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, not everybody's going to be manufacturing a $10,000 product like me. If you're starting off small, you know, you're going to have to go with the samples. It's going to take a lot of communication back and forth. Um, you know, quality for you and quality for them. And when I say them, I'm not in a bad way or a racial way or anything like that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It, it's two different uh, things. So you always want to make sure the quality is good. You know? Yeah. Luckily, the people who I work with, um, it's a husband and wife family. I know the owners of the factory. You know, we go, we eat, we go out, they take care of us. Um, and he's actually an engineer by trade. So his attention to detail is so uh, like it's, it's very good. You know, it's like, he puts a lot of care, effort, and attention to it. Um, so, you know, you got to start off small communication. Uh, don't assume anything <laughs> at all. You know, a lot of the times like, Oh, well, we think they'll know how to do this or, you know, don't assume anything like all, you know, make sure your barcodes are good. Make sure, you know, it's all the details. Um, but it's just going to come down to communication. Uh, you know, there's no secret about it. <laughs> It's challenging and you may run, run out of money before you, <laughs> you get your final product that you want. So you got to make sure that you, you're in for the long haul over there. 
especially if you're developing something from scratch or start off local, you know, find a local supplier here in the U.S. You know, there's a lot of manufacturing coming back here. Uh, it can be done. Maybe your margins are not going to be as good, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that's okay. You know, there's a lot of business models where, you know, maybe you break even the first six months and then, okay, you find, okay, what you need. And then you go and get it duplicated overseas. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever you make modifications or iterations to your product, what do you try to do instead, you know, or do you, do you going to have a, maybe another project where you want to create another product that's entirely different, but it's still related to what your business is about. Have you thought about that or is it always yeah, about I mean, making the, 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 the new photo booth we just launched, you know, that I started that project in, I would say March, like right when COVID happened. Mm hmm Cause prior to that, you know, we didn't really have any photo boots that we could sell less than 5,000. Uh, and so this one, you know, it comes in at 4,000 was, was the lowest price that we could get it to, uh, but still providing, you know, great quality and a product that's worth renting out. So that one all started with like, okay, what, uh, what problem am I trying to solve for that? So with that one, we tried to solve the portability problem because there's a lot of single woman operators that, you know, call us and get started and they can't handle uh, you know, like one of our bigger products, which is like Mirror 3. Mm -hmm. But they still want the Mirror um, uh, effect, if you will. And so, you know, it started off with that, the portability. So, uh, you know, I had to just draw out a few concepts um, and see which one, you know, check with a few people, friends and family. You know, my wife works with me. She, uh, you know, we did the photo booth rentals together. You know, we've been together for 10 years now. And, uh, she's, uh, you know, like, Hey, what do you think of this? She always just like, is like, nah, it doesn't look good. It's good. You know? So if it passes her test, then, you know, I feel like I'm good. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just like, okay, what features next? Okay. So we're like, Hey, we want it to have a bright light. We want, you know, awesome led lights to like, uh, you know, make people attracted to it. We want speakers in there because we want people to have it in their homes to like, just sitting off in the corner, maybe not using a photo booth. You got people over there. You want to play some music. So we put really awesome speakers in it. Uh, okay. What type of computer? So we go through the components. Once we got all of that stuff, then we're like, Hey, we send it over to the engineer. Like can all this stuff fit into the smallest, you know, form possible. And then let's see, you know, what they come back with and just go back and forth like that. And we went through about four different versions before we were happy, you know, and it costs money, you know, each one, uh, you know, getting the metal painted, doing the assembly, uh, running all the cords, shipping, you know, the samples, it's tough. Um, but, you know, I, I saw the vision long term and, you know, we had a great launch. We launched it uh, November 6th. You know, we already sold uh, close to 100 of them and uh, people love it. The price point's good. Uh, it solves all their problems. They can leave it unattended. Uh, it's not a big investment. We really want to help people uh, get started. And maybe a ten thousand dollar booth is uh, intimidating for someone to get started up front. So we have this entry entry photo booth that they can get started with, and um, you know, rent it out and then upgrade later. You know. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think yeah. it's always a good option to have. Mm -hmm. You know, several options, not just the one expensive one. Exactly. Especially if you're going to use it as a couple times here. Now, can you tell us your your, your marketing strategies? Like, how do you sell such an expensive? product you know do you do you run facebook ads of course you have click funnels what yeah. are your, mar your marketing strategies here yeah it's great great question man great you're a good, great yeah. interviewer um okay. yeah i love marketing man that's pretty much what my time is spent on now uh you know the business pretty much runs itself we have you know uh, i'd say a dozen employees you know some virtual you know some here in the u.s some philippines and so uh, my marketing strategy is google ads uh there's nothing no surprise there I think a lot of people are so focused with Facebook ads now, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this on the podcast, you know, <laughs> like Facebook ads for service businesses and for certain businesses is trash. Okay. Now you're, you're an e-com guy, right? I think, right. I like e-com more than anything else. Okay. So yeah. Now for e-com it's great. It's perfect. Right. But now look, if I'm talking to a plumber, right. And I see this plumber, you know, running a business and he's like, Hey, I'm running Facebook ads. It's not working. How are you going to target somebody that has a leak on Facebook? You know, you can't, but because the e-com guys are pushing so much, 
into the business environment, everybody thinks it's so cool to run Facebook ads now. And they're wasting a lot of money. Every day I speak to people like, hey, uh, you know, I have a lawn care business. Uh, I'm running Facebook ads. And bro, you need to be on Google because you need, like, people go to Google to solve their problem, right? You have a business that solves a problem. They go to Facebook to escape their problems, right? And I, I know I'm, e-commerce great. And I know you, I know you changed your, your, your body position. No, no, there. I'm saying like, no, I don't do any e-commerce at all. I'm just saying yeah, yeah. that out of all the business models that I've encountered, that's my favorite one, but I've haven't made one sale in e-commerce. This is okay. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, there's probably going to be, you know, some people listening in and, and tuning in, but you know, it's like uh, Google ads, man, it, it, it's nothing better than that. If, if somebody's searching for a problem and you can solve it right there and be at the top position, mm. that's it. There's no question about it, you know? And so, I mean, when people search, you know, start a photo booth business, buy a photo booth, uh, you know, uh, side hustle or whatever, whatever the, you know, stuff like that. My ads come up, they click the ad, they go to the website. They like everything they see on the website. They fill out the quote form. I get the lead, you know, the sales team uh, follows up with them. We have a 45 day email sequence that drips out to them every other day. Um, then uh, what else? Retargeting. You know, we do Facebook retargeting. Okay. So okay. if they come to the website, they don't fill out the form, show them this video, uh, show them this ad, show them this image. Um, we do a lot of that. And wait, um, how many people have you gotten? Like how many sales have you gotten from those retargeting? Maybe someone was on the form or maybe on the checkout, but didn't buy anything. But with that retargeting strategy, how many sales would you typically get? Um, so most of the sales are done over the phone. Okay. Uh, so nobody, we've tried like, Hey, check out and buy a $5,000 product without speaking to someone it, like almost impossible. So we, it's, it's hard to track that number. Mm -hmm. I just know like, okay, what's my cost per lead, you know, with retargeting. Yeah. Uh, it, and it's, I would say it's 50% what my, uh, cost per lead is on, on my search ads, you know? Okay. So, you know, I would say, Maybe it's twenty dollars for a lead is what I pay, and then the retargeting lead maybe seven to ten dollars from Facebook. Uh, but also, I you know with the retargeting, we'll still retarget them even after they become a lead. Like we'll hit them with testimonials, we'll hit them with like training videos. Uh, you know, so we have a, a few different retargeting ads set up um, uh, to to hit them because the the sales process for us, you know, it's about let's say maybe thirty to forty five days. Mm -hmm. So we have to do a lot of nurturing in between that time. You know, maybe they just went to an event and they saw the photo booth. They're like, oh man, that's a great idea. Come back home that night, Google like photo booths. We come up, they fill out the form, you know, and then they have to, let's say, travel back to their, then when they came out of, out of town wedding, right? And a couple of days to travel back home and then we reach them. I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to think about it. And then we show them all the, you know, the reviews to testimonials, that kind of stuff. So that's my secret strategy there, man. We, we get, we Google first. Uh, and then just retargeting on Facebook and that, you know, that works magic. And, you know, I've implemented that same strategy with, you know, a tinting business. I have a gym that I'm working with now. Uh, we're doing it with an IT company. Um, uh, and it just, it works well. Wait one second. I feel damn, like it makes perfect sense. Now that I think about it, that you have to, for an expensive product, I don't think people are going to just hit click and, and buy, right? Yeah. They want more information. They want affirmation. They want to know that what they're buying is solid, right? Yeah. Now, this can be a major challenge where, okay, you need, now they call you, they're a warm lead, a hot lead. Mm -hmm. And now it's your job or someone else's job to close them. Mm -hmm. So how have you approached that? Or how have you learned to close a deal and get the money on the phone? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, I did Grant Cardone's great for that. If you know Uncle G, <laughs> if you can read his books, he, he'll teach you how to close. You know, I, I learned my sales from him. Uh, we got Cardone University. You know, all of my staff, uh, they do three videos, Cardone University every day. So they log in, they do their videos. So everybody's in this, they're motivated. You know, everybody knows what's going on. So whether you speak to me, whether you speak to customer service or tech support, mm -hmm. everybody's in a, in a closing state of mind. You know, it's, it's all about closing. So a lot of people, you know, the simplest way is like remove this, the distance between you and the customer's money, right? Like a lot of people, hey, okay, well, let me know, call me back, you know, uh, talk with your husband, like, hey, thanks for calling, you know, Photo Booth International, you know, what made you look at a photo booth? Oh, you know, I was looking to 
um, you know, make some extra money or a sod, you know, whatever. So depending on whatever answer they provide, then we kind of, you know, go down that path with them and show them what the future is going to look like, put them in the future state of mind. Oh, I, I need some extra side money, you know, or I'm unhappy at my job. Oh, perfect. Well, that's actually what we specialize in. Josh started the company, uh, you know, from nothing. And, you know, he was let go of, uh, you know, his corporate job. And now he teaches, you know, thousands of people all over the world how to do this business and everything's provided to you. Uh, you know, have you started a business before? No, it's my first time. Okay, perfect. Well, you know, we have the business contract, we have the sales training, everything that you need, uh, you know, to start your business. Uh, you know, were you thinking about doing financing or, you know, paying a credit card? Because we do have a great financing option. So if somebody wants to um, buy a photo booth, they actually don't have to pay for it out of pocket. So we can get them financed over the phone. You know, within one hour, we can, if they want to buy a $10,000 photo booth, we can fill out a credit app. They can get, we can see the approval right away. Mm -hmm. We can fill out all that stuff. So we try to push them towards uh, financing um, and, you know, just kind of go from there, answer their questions. Most of the time it's, it's tech questions because it's like, what type okay. of camera? Where's the printer? How much is the prints? How do I make layouts? What about the software? You know, so as long as we address all of that and show them like, hey, you, you know, a lot of people buy stuff and they're not, they buy a course, right? Maybe they buy a five grand course, right? And you're not getting anything <laughs> in return. You know, you're buying our product, you're getting an even exchange for your money for value and you're getting all the training for free. Mm -hmm. You know, like, look, try it out for a couple months. If it doesn't work out, sell the, sell the photo booth. You'll, you'll probably break even or maybe lose a little bit of money, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and at least you'll sleep better knowing like, Hey, you tried a business and hey, it's not for you, or maybe it's for you, you know, yeah. uh, you're exchanging the man money for value and you're getting a lot of value in return. And, uh, you know, we have a, a proven blueprint and, uh, yeah, just conveying that to them. We offer a lot and it's hard to. Um, get all of it across over the phone. So we try to like identify, you know, their pain points and try to show them how we can solve it. You mm -hmm. know, just be nice, man. Just nice. And a lot of people, a lot of companies don't pick up the phone. I call my competitors all the time. They don't pick up the phone, right? Everything is schedule a call. Hey, not everybody wants to schedule a call, bro. What happened before like call scheduling? <laughs> people used to pick up the phone, you know, people can pick up the phone and call me. They, they see me on YouTube. Uh, they hear me on podcast. They can call me and text me. You know, I got a, a community number. I'll give it out if anybody wants to text me. Yeah, for sure. Let me do that. Uh, it's 972-284-0506. 972-284-0506. You can text me. That comes right to my phone. I chat with people all the time. People like us because, you know, we're real. There's no, you know, a lot of companies, like my competitors, you don't know who's running the company. You know, they have their staff that do everything and, you know, when you try to get on the phone with them, they're like, oh, um, well, we're tied up right now, but we're happy to chat with you. So we, we take the service to another level, man. Uh, and we take it so high that it's, it's ridiculous to try to compete with us. You know, we have people come in from all over the country to, to our showroom, we have a showroom in Dallas. You know, we get them a limo at the airport. We, we take them, we get a hotel for them. You know, they come to the office, we get food for them, we sit down, hey, Let's talk. Let's look at all the photo booths. We spend hours with them. You know, no one, no one's doing that anymore. You know, everybody's so, so much an ego. No one can get on the phone if you, you know, and so we just try to break all that. I try to, you know, serve our customers and they see it. They can feel it. The first thing they say, Hey, the customer service is great so far. You know, and we haven't even bought from you guys yet. Like exactly. That's, it's the company that I want to, uh, it's the way I want to be treated when I go to another company. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, Hey, take care of me, man. I'm spending a lot of money here. You know, I went. I bought a truck recently, I got a Chevy uh, uh, Silverado, and uh, you know, I go to the dealership. The guy has a forty-five thousand dollar truck, right? And I'm like, hey man, uh, you know, you have any water or something? I'm thirsty. He's like, no, we don't. But there's a water, there's a, a water fountain down there by the bathrooms. I'm like, bro, I'm about to drop forty-five k. Like go on, go to the vending machine, buy me a bottle of water and come back. You know what I mean? Like there's no decency anymore. No one knows how to do that. So I'm, I break the mold in that sense. Uh, you know, we provide them in training videos and just take care of the customer, man. Like yeah, there's no secret. That's the age old secret, right? But nobody's doing it. Yeah. I mean, um, 
I think I was actually listening to a podcast this morning and it was about this guy, this Harvard professor analyzing Amazon, Amazon's business strategy and what, I mean, it was Jeff Bezos strategy here. And he said, there's three ways to really improve a business, either be better, be cheaper, or just focus on the customer. And, and he said like a lot of businesses focus on a customer, but no one's really doing it. Yeah. And I guess that's what you're doing. And I feel that it's a, it's an old school strategy. It's a fundamental one that maybe a lot of people aren't applying today because right now it's covered by, you know, conversions and, and yeah, whatnot. Automation and, yeah. Automation. You know, all the send, other processes. Yeah. Calendar, but, you know, send me a link, bro. And I'll book your calendar. You know, <laughs> we'll talk next Tuesday. You know how much of, you know how much risk that is? If I were to, uh, uh, to tell someone, Hey, I'm going to send you my link and you book something next Wednesday. You know how many things could happen in between that time? You're going to get a divorce. So you're, you know, someone's going to get into a car accident. Somebody's grandma's going to pass away. You know, I, I, I'm just being serious with you. You know, it's all tragic stuff. Yeah. Okay. But that's the stuff that kills deals. If somebody books me, Hey, I'm calling them right away. Hey, I saw you made a booking. Uh, you got some, you got a second to chat and people have time, you know, if they don't have time, Hey, call me back in 30 minutes or whatever. But if you're going to wait till next Tuesday, because that's when they click the link, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to call you and I'm going to sell you before then. And then when that, when that call comes, you're going to have wasted time because somebody else already called them before that and closed it. You know? So you always got to be close no matter what, you know, always, always got to be aggressive on, on the offense. <laughs> On the offense. Yeah. Now for your product, uh, if I take a photo, is it, do I get a physical photo as well? Like you get in a, in a typical photo booth and do I also get a, a digitized uh, form? Yeah. Yeah. You get both. So you can do a uh, printing. Uh, we have the photo booths that, that do printing uh, and social media. Uh, so yeah. all of them have the same features. Yeah. They I was going to say, have a printer plugged in. you know, it's, it's really dope because um, I always had this question where, you know, why are books still popular today? And people thought, you know, books would be obsolete now with the Kindle audio books, but the fact that books, print books are still really high in demand. And you can yeah. ask the same question about photo booths. Why can't you just take a, a photo with your camera? Why not? You don't need a photo booth, but it shows you that the human element, they want something physical as well. Right. And it's really cool to think about that aspect. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs can, you know, can think about those sorts of ideas that even though we're, going into a more digitized format, digitized products, I think there's still a human element in us that's never going to go away. Exactly. Yeah, it's an experience, man. When, when you're at an event, you know, like everybody's, like all the family problems go away. You know what I mean? Like let's say there's beef within the family. You know, if there's a way someone's getting married, everybody like, you know, puts it down for a sec. Like, hey, put your, put your guns down. You know what I mean? <laughs> just chill, bro. Let's just have a good night tonight. You know what I mean? We got the photo booth there. Everybody's, you know, get a little drinks. Hey, we're taking pictures with the family. We're having fun. It's a good experience. It's, it's capturing the memories, right? And you know, some, this is what happened to us before. Like, hey, grandma was there, right? The whole family was together after a long time. They all took pictures, got back home, and then grandma passed away a couple of weeks later. That was the last pictures that all the family got together at the photo booth, you know? Mm. Like, that's a memory that they'll have forever. You know, and remember that night and that experience and the fun that they had. And, and, and you're there capturing it. That's not going to go away, man. There's three biggest mo uh, times in your life, right? The day you're born, the day you get married, and the day you die, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. right? Those three things. And, and it, the photo boots are going to be, you know, part of one of those events. And so, um, you know, right now with COVID, you know, everybody's scared. But at the end of the day, all the events that's supposed to happen, you know, this year, you know, they got moved to, la to next year or so. There's going to be massive demand for it. Uh, and yeah. there's quite a bit of smart people taking advantage right now. You know, uh, like last weekend, we had like five people come to the showroom. A uh, couple of them came in from uh, Memphis, Louisiana, and South Texas. And, uh, you know, they, they actually went with the higher end packages. You know, they, they liked like the Mirror 2, Mirror 3s. And so they spent a pretty decent amount of money. And I was like, you know, I interviewed them on our YouTube channel. Like, hey, how do you make a decision like that right now? Everybody's scared. You know, it's the end of the world. You know, apocalypse is coming, zombies, <laughs> yeah. all that good stuff. Yeah. And you coming over here and dropping $10,000. How do you make a decision like that? And they're like, hey, we know that. I mean, it's not going to go anywhere. You know, people are still having parties. People are still having events. Yes, some of the states are on lockdown. We understand. But to think that, hey, uh, wedding's never going to happen again, party's never going to happen again, that's kind of short-sighted, you know. So what the COVID did for a lot of people in, in the industry, you know, it leveled out the playing field, and it's a great time to, to get, 
into the game because hey, some of the big players, <clears throat> let's say if, you know, if there's a major rental company that, you know, is operating in two states and they had, you know, 30, 40 boots and it was hard to compete with them, but now COVID crushed them. Maybe they're not doing as good. You know, they lowered their prices and now uh, it's a good time for you to come in and be able to compete with them and grow your business like that. You know, so I think a level the playing field for a lot of people exposed a lot of weakness. You know, people weren't ready. You weren't saving. Uh, you know, thankfully, you know, the way I run my business, hey, we got cash reserves, you know, and you should run a business. And that comes back to the accounting thing. Like, hey, you yeah. got to know how much, you know, you got in the bank account because at any given time, I'll never take this lightly again. You know, people your whole life, hey, prepare for the recession, this and that. Man, that's never going to happen. Now, it's like, hey, <laughs> anything can happen, right? So you mm -hmm. always got to have the reserves in there. So you said that's your, your most important hire, the accountant. Yeah, yeah, the accountant. But it, no, I would say you need to know the skill. You know, you don't have yeah. to know, you don't have to have an accounting degree. You need to know how to audit. So I like to tell people this. I tell people, look, you don't have to know how to do everything. You just need to know enough that you don't get screwed over. Right. <laughs> and, and whether you're getting your car repaired or, you know, you're hiring someone to build a house for you or build a funnel for you or do your, your, your accounting. Cause if you don't know enough, they are not going to do as good of a job because they know that you don't know, you know, yeah, that's the truth. Sure. Look, that's the truth. I, I've been through five different people. And I went to the accountant that has the downtown office building on the 23rd floor and the long wooden desk. And we all go in there and we sit down and, and they got a receptionist that's going to bring you water and all that. And then the accountant that I have now, he doesn't even have an office. And, and the, the one in downtown, he did me, he did me dirty, you know? So it comes back down to, you know, me having enough business acumen to understand like, Hey, this guy's not doing a good job or he's doing it incorrectly from what I know. And like, uh, we need to find someone that's going to do it the way we understand that's going to collaborate with you so that you can make a better financial decision when it's like time to come, yeah. you know? Now, what are some golden gems that you've learned throughout your years of entrepreneurship? And I feel like you're, you're doing something completely different or really different from what I've, you know, been exposed to, you know, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs doing drop shipping, SMMA, but you're actually going to China finding these products, high-end products, right? Yeah. Now, from all your years of experience, what are some golden gems that you think are really important for aspiring entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who are just, you know, making some cash and doing pretty well for, for themselves? Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you asked me that. Let me, I have, actually have a, uh, uh, a list of that. So uh, let no. me uh, pull it up here. Yeah, so. No worries, no worries. <laughs> um, if you, so you said entrepreneurs who are making cash, Already yeah. or just getting started? Both, both, why not? Okay, cool, okay, cool. So yeah, getting started, if you have a business partner or anything, so uh, the, the guy who I started the photo booth business with, you know, we, we've been friends before that for 10 years. And when you're starting off, it's all gravy. Hey, I love you, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> and like, you never think anything's gonna happen. And everybody told us this, everybody told us. This. When we went to the attorney to set up the LLC, he's like, hey, if you guys ever come to any problems, I can't help you because it will be a conflict of interest. And I'm like, man, sh shut up, man. I love <laughs> this guy right here. You know what I mean? Two years later, when the cash starts flowing in, hey, it's a whole nother story. So you need to have, obviously set up your LLC properly, okay? You gotta get the accountant. All right, you're gonna interview the accountant, make sure you got the, the accountant right. Then you're gonna have a, 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 if it's a friend, a business partner that you're doing it with, you need to have a friendship agreement and say, hey, if this doesn't work out, we need to agree to a split up and, and define what exactly that means. Okay, mm -hmm. you take this much, I take this much, and we walk away and we remain friends. Okay, so talk about, start with the end in mind. And, and what does it, does the end look like? We didn't have that set up and it got really nasty. He sued me, I sued him. There's a buyout agreement. I bought his shares out. He breached the contract six months later. And like, it was just back and forth for years. Luckily all that's over with now and it was good lessons to learn. But if we, uh, if we had the, the buyout agreement um, done properly, uh, we wouldn't have had any uh, issues uh, with especially the non-compete because that's the uh, area of the contract that he breached. Uh, and then also like if we had some kind of agreement in place, like, hey, if this doesn't work out, 
you know, you can buy me out or I'll buy you out for X amount of dollars. And then we just walk away, you know? So I would say that would be the first uh, thing to kind of address. Um, let's see what else I got here. Um, yeah, you know, focus on the, the marketing. I think a lot of people right now is uh, learning operations first before how to, to sell their product or service. Um, and I think like, okay, that's cool how to build a team and, you know, how to, you know, do customer service and, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, if nobody knows you and, and nobody is like, uh, can find your business or service or product, whatever it is, uh, then I think that's going to be a waste of time. So that's why, I mean, I've been able to be successful because I've been able to have, uh, to get like marketing under control, you know, and figure out what's going to work for me. So I think that's, should be a little bit more focus, uh, you know, on that. Uh, and then, you know, from that, it's gonna come like the sales and the customer service, like the way we do it, you know, like, like you said, you know, go above and beyond like the Amazon model. You know, if you have a dropship company, then it's, it's a little bit harder to do that, obviously, but, uh, you know, do whatever you can. Um, let's see, we covered a lot of it already, it looks like. Um, now those are some good gems right there, though. <laughs> Especially the yeah, business part. Also, like, um, sorry, man. Uh, yeah, don't don't. You know, a lot of people got wiped out uh, with this this COVID thing because they were heavily invested into one um, industry, if you will. You know. You know, I've been um, fortunate to have, you know, real estate. So I take the, the profits that I make from business, I put it into appreciating cash flowing assets. And so a lot of times as entrepreneurs, you hear like, oh, just reinvest the money into your business. It's like, okay, that's cool and everything, but you know, you got you need to take something off the top and you need to invest it into appreciating assets, right? So I have commercial real estate, um, I have residential real estate, uh, and I, I did that with the profits from the business. So let's say you, you're off to the races, you're running. And even from the beginning, like maybe you can't buy real estate in the beginning, but you can buy stocks, you know, I, and I teach on my YouTube channel, like investing in dividend paying stocks, Fortune 500 companies. So taking your, your profits from your business and investing into stocks and real estate, I think that's mm -hmm. something that's not talked about a lot. You know, if somebody's doing, you know, SMMA and, uh, you know, drop shipping. Okay. You got, you sitting on some cash or, you know, you taking a paycheck or whatever you need to be investing into other things because that product can be, you could, a patent could come out. Um, you know, it could be the FDA could disapprove the product. I mean, a bunch of different things. There's so much at risk, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you never know about this stuff until it just happens just like that. You